I am very happy to invite you to the first uh, first lecture of this season of CCP events. We are in our we are in our twelfth cycle now, and uh, we have finished about more than uh, eighty talks formally, but actually a uh, hundred talks uh, otherwise. And we are very happy that. Uh, 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 constantly, we have been receiving a very interesting mix of people uh, who come and attend uh, our talks. Uh, and in, in the pursuit of reaching out to a wider audience, we've also uh, started to try out uh, live streaming our uh, sessions because we understand that we are in the northernmost part of the city and it's the most difficult thing to travel from the southern parts of the city and come here at this hour of the time. So I want to just say that we are actually live on Facebook. And if you want any of your friends to uh, under, uh, to kind of uh, catch up on this event and those are stuck in traffic maybe yet, they can tune in to our Facebook page. You can WhatsApp them. I would urge all uh, my students to share the link of our uh, 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 live uh, 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 Facebook uh, streaming. Uh, uh, on your page so that more people can come and join us. We'll also take questions at the end of uh, uh, the session from our live audience. So uh, please stay uh, uh, stay tuned to the uh, thing because you'll also get a chance to interact even if you're not physically present here. Uh, so that was the uh, kind of uh, logistical thing. But just to give a very brief introduction about uh, the C City, as I said, it is in our uh, it is uh, the twelfth cycle of the event, and C City was conceived as a platform at the School of Environment and Architecture uh, to uh, for public discourse on uh, issues related not only just to architecture but also to other allied disciplines which feed into it very centrally. Uh, and uh, in this kind of uh, frame, we have been inviting people from a lot of different backgrounds, including architects. Uh, cultural theorists, anthropologists, artists, uh, um, even singers, musicians, uh, performance artists, and so on. So, <clears throat> so it's a very wide uh, kind of, uh, we cover a very wide spectrum of uh, uh, discourses at, on this platform, and they consciously feed into our thought streams uh, at the school, uh, and the way in which we kind of look at architecture as a culturally embedded practice. Today, we have a very interesting practice with us, uh, very young and you know, innovative uh, and uh, uh, very uh, uh, <coughs> uh, sensitive practice with us. We have uh, Anand Sonecha from C-Lab and uh, uh, C-Lab is a practice based in Ahmedabad and uh, 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 run by Anand Sonecha, founded by Anand Sonecha, who is an architect from Ahmedabad. Uh, he studied architecture at IPSA Rajkot uh, and pursued his thesis with uh, Professor Balkrishn Doshi. Um, and later he worked out, uh, in India uh, with, uh, uh, with him, and, uh, with Professor Doshi and Rajiv Katpalia. Uh, and then he went on uh, uh, to Portugal to practice, uh, to uh, kind of assist uh, Alvaro Siza and uh, Carlos Castanheira. And uh, recently he has designed uh, uh, and built projects, uh, which is very famous also on our poster, the Jay Jagat Theatre, which, uh, which kind of talks about the simplicity and elegance uh, almost to the like of Siza himself. Uh, and today he'll be talking about that project. Along with it, he'll also talk about two more projects uh, uh, in in more detail. So um, without uh, much, uh, and uh, I may say that uh, Anand has presented his works at various kinds of uh, uh, places, uh, forums. Uh, he has presented work at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in USA as a part of the India GSD lecture series. Uh, he has exhibited his works at the uh, Gallery Lumine uh, Roland uh, Orleans for essay in Delhi and the Faculty of Arts and Design and Humanities at the Leicester School of Architecture, De Montfort University in UK. Uh, recently, uh, the Jay Jagat Theatre was also published in Casabella, Italy uh, with an essay by uh, Siza himself. So uh, I will uh, I'll now invite Anand to elaborate upon his engagement with all these masters and also all his learnings that have fed into uh, his work that we'll see today. So welcome, Anand. Thank you, Anuj, for the generous introduction. Uh, Mumbai has a very special place in my heart. I was telling Rupali that uh, for two reasons. One, uh, I was born here in Borivali, uh, 
uh, it's I'm glad to be back. Uh, and second reason is our cat Clara was also from Mumbai, and uh, she was our first client. And uh, this is with her our practice started. I'm not going to show about this project, but I wanted to remember her. So I'm going to show three projects. Uh, one is uh, Jayjaga Theatre in Sabarmati Ashram. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about a community in Western uh, housing for the loving community. Uh, and the third project I'm going to uh, discuss is School for the Visual Impact Students in Gandhinagar, which is an ongoing project. It's under construction. It is under construction. But I'm going to talk about uh, the different uh, processes that uh, we have uh, tried to uh, accomplish with this project. So there are more than 1,000 students uh, currently living uh, and studying in Savarmati Ashram. Uh, they are from very uh, remote places of Gujarat, like very small villages that they, they come. And many of them probably had come to Amdar for the first time. So those are the kind of students that they study and live in Savarmati Ashram. Uh, and uh, they did not have a uh, place for performance uh, uh, to uh, practice their skills. So they, they used to always go to uh, either Matrani or uh, uh, Tagore Hall or, or Amphitheater in near the Sarvati Riverfront. So they had to travel long distances. So uh, in 2017, uh, it was decided that we'll build Jaijaga Theater uh, to commemorate 100 years of ashram. Uh, as a gift uh, to the children of ashram and neighboring communities. So, the person in the center in this photograph, just confused. So he's Nino. Uh, so he he is the visionary behind the project. So he is a musician, uh, and he works with children in ashram. And it was his idea that uh, we should have our own amphitheater in in ashram. And uh, it is because of him the project has turned how it is because he challenged me in many ways that I'm going to uh, show in detail. So before going to the project, I wanted to share uh, a little bit about Sabarmati Ashram, how Ashram has grown over the period of time. Uh, Gandhiji came to Ahmedabad in 1915 from South Africa. He lived in Kocha Ashram before. Uh, for two years, and uh, in 1917, he came to this piece of land on, on River Savarmati. So, Savarmati is here, and this was the first structure in the ashram called Udyog Mandir. Um, and so, there was, there was this story that uh, very famous, and people keep telling in ashram uh, that Gandhiji thought this place uh, as, as, as his uh, place of struggle for independence because as a satyagrahi either you go to uh, jail or either you die so it's better to be in between so i don't know if this, this is a true story but it, I, I like to believe that because there is a crematorium near the ashram and then there is a savarmati jail but uh, as the struggle for the independence uh, intensified uh, people from different parts of the country they started coming to ashram and then all or this was the first structure. So all these small structures, they, they, they kept adding. Uh, this is the central kitchen where the food for the entire ashram used to get cooked. Gandhiji lived here in Radhe Kunj. And this is Nandini where all the leaders who used to come to meet Gandhiji used to live. And this, there was this huge dormitory where all the students and freedom fighters they used to live. And there was this small school uh, which still, still exists. Uh, used, used to be the part of ashram. And now today is this situation. You have Ashram Road, which divides Ashram in, uh, Savarmati Ashram into two parts. Uh, there is a, a riverfront edge. Uh, also, it's very defined now. Uh, and you have Memorial Museum here. So there are a lot of trees now uh, in Ashram because uh, people have uh, during in 1930s they have planted a lot of new trees, and now Ashram is full of very well named trees. So this is a very different place. Now it's unfortunately it is divided starkly between two parts because of this road. So many people don't know that this part of the ashram is also used to be called Sarvanti Ashram, but people generally just uh, go to Memorial Museum and Radha Kunj and 
uh, think this is only ashram. Even when I was a student, I used to think that this is Sabarmati ashram, but in fact, it is the entire campus. So, uh, the area of intervention for Jai Jagat Theatre is here to orient you to you is uh, this is the Kunj, uh, this is Memorial Museum, River is here. Uh, and our intervention is across the road uh, on, a, on, a, on a very silent corner of Ashram uh, near this school. And there is this Bal Mandir uh, uh, kindergarten, which was uh, in 1940, uh, uh, it's, it was started. So I was given the area of intervention. Sorry. Uh, not specifying where to locate, but they said that I could build an uh, amphitheater in any of the location I, I, uh, I decide. So uh, this is uh, the area of intervention. This is a kind of uh, environment uh, where this huge neem trees and, and this Balman, there is very old structure, 1940s. It. And uh, again, this was not in a very good condition because uh, it was on the other side of the ashram it was not it was neglected and people used to uh, dump all the waste onto this part and uh, it is just be before like five to seven years now this place uh, had been maintained and got it back into its original spirit but uh, it was not in a good shape before seven years um, Nino's brief was very strong uh, i think that it it it, it was very important that he defined as a client uh, his vision, uh, and there was a dialogue between uh, both of us. Uh, so he he told me in, in our first meeting that you, you should create a theater which feels that it was always there. And I, I, I did not understand what, what does that mean. It is the most difficult thing as an architect. Uh, but he, he said like that. Uh, he said that landscape should dominate. Uh, he also mentioned that uh, it should be simple, playful, so that children would like, come and like to perform. Uh, and the capacity, of course, is 300 to 350 persons cap capacity. But this was his condition, and uh, it was very important. And then he asked me, what is your condition as an architect? I don't know why. Very instinctively, I said that uh, we should start once I'm ready, uh, which when I feel that we are ready to start, you should give me enough time. And that's what he did. He gave me two years to do the process. And I think that uh, it was very important. So uh, in that process, I also started to look at uh, theaters, how uh, historically different civilization people have conceived theaters. Uh, so. This is a theater of universities in Acropolis. It is on the southern tip of uh, Acropolis and it was built in 4th century BC. Uh, I, when I saw this, I felt that Greeks were very careful about choosing their location. So they always made sure that they built the theaters in, in, in a location in which it integrates. So man and nature are always equal. Uh, whereas... Uh, in, in Rome, Romans were, were a bit different. They, they built objects in space. So, uh, so man dominates nature. That's what I felt. Of course, uh, the purposes were quite different, but I was looking broad, broadly uh, how they organized their structures. Whereas in our culture, uh, it, it, was, it was very inspiring to see that uh, this, this is in... Uh, uh, these are Sita Gondra and Jogi Mara caves in Chhattisgarh. Uh, and uh, there was not nothing formal about the theater. So there were not formal stage or seating. There was just this, this very primitive kind of an environment. And uh, there was a very blurred boundary between man and nature. And that, that's what was very inspiring. And it was the same time during uh, Greeks were building theater of nuances. So this is also 4th century uh, old structure, BC, and, uh, and I, I read that uh, Megdut was written here. So it was quite, quite uh, inspiring to see how we were looking at theaters. Um, in, and also I saw, uh, uh, this is a 15th century example. Uh, this is by Palladio, uh, Theater Olympico. Uh, here, 
what i found very uh, amazing is that he made theater as a part of performance so he, he what he did was that this is the stage and he created this uh, illusions this first streets in perspective so this is the stage the stage and this is these are the streets that he created so as a, when you are, when you are sitting as an audience you see all these uh, streets and then performers can make this as a part of their performance so this was very uh, inspiring also to look at theaters becoming the part of of the plays and and he also saw it in a very different way where he he removed himself from the place and i felt he made an independent construct but still very universal so it this this was this was a world theater used to float through the through different parts and and it goes to different location it becomes a part of the place but still it is independent in on in its own way so it was very inspiring so now i had to start working uh, and i decided this corner uh, where I, i i felt that i should build the theater because when you are entering from here because here is the entrance i i, I didn't want the theater to be seen so when you are here you feel that you are still in a very uh, old place and then slowly you discover the theater it could be an element of surprise uh, also i was thinking how should i reveal theater so should i build everything above ground uh, or below ground or partially ground and alter the landscape and i chose that uh, i should build partially below ground and partially above ground so that the the theater is not above the human eye level so it, it doesn't feel imposing because 300 people capacity theater if you want to design it it is a big structure so this section will help you to understand much better so this uh, this was the uh, area of intervention so what we did was we dug 1.8 meters and because we are going down i understood that what is going to get collected and it it was the lowest point of the entire ashram so what is going to be collected there so i thought that why not to collect everything and make a big tank so uh, we made 80000 liters of water tank uh, which is below the stage so if this is the stage the entire, half of the stage is the water tank and then uh, the seating is here, the stage is here and then I, of course create a retaining wall because i also had to retain uh, the earth and also i felt that it needs a structure i did uh, to organize the space because all the three sides were not uh, not uh, very convenient because uh, one angle was too steep and other side was perpendicular so i felt that there was a need of an a uh, very strong uh, container and then since i was going down uh, the disadvantage was that i was losing connection with the surrounding so uh, then i felt that i should create huge openings uh, so that i'm always looking at this building the trees and the surrounding context which i'm going to show you more in detail so this was uh, very important uh, i f- i feel uh, that when you enter here you you come to this plaza is a big gathering space and then slowly you uh, take a ramp and go to the amphitheater and this is my favorite place because i think that this is uh, it relates with more our architecture and and uh, that what we saw in sita bhavana case i think this this space has a lot of multiple multiple uses and this is very formal place which is also important that students should be able to uh, perform and get confidence um, so i i feel that this was very important and the geometry is very simple there are two circles uh, which uh, uh, one circle is shifted so it creates a spiral and then from here you you go down there is a ramp uh, so this is lower uh, so sitting is here the stage is here and below is this water tank uh, 70000 uh, 80000 liter capacity um, and this is the plan um, 
So the section shows this relation. So this is the ground level, and then this is the tank which I was talking. And then there are these small elements which I'm going to show you in different slides that uh, I added so that it becomes a part of the place. What the uh, there in Vicenza, he introduced all these elements so that it becomes a part of the theater. So this is the balcony which I was talking. So we were imagining that if there is a show, there is a Juliet show, and then students can use that. Uh, or they, there can be a ceremonial uh, entry uh, to the theater. And also these openings uh, for which helps from inside to outside, and also outside to inside. So this was very important to have the connect connections. So this is the this is where you enter, and then slowly because there's a lot of trees here, uh, so you you walk through these huge trees and created small niches where students can uh, study because there's this school and then there's this uh, PTC uh, Teachers Training College. Um, and then slowly you come to this uh, big plaza and then slowly you go down to go inside of the theater. So from outside, from the entrance, you see like this, so you don't see the theater. But this, this walkway is important so that students can use in, in the way they want. So after entering here, you take this ramp and you see first balcony, and then the perform the audience sit here, and then there is a stage. Uh, there is a ceremonial entry for the performance uh, here, and then there is a small exit. So there is an alley through which uh, the students can hide and go back. So this is a model which shows the entrance to. So this is how it. Uh, sits with the uh, surroundings. So this is the existing building and there's no openings, there's just blank wall and there's one uh, entrance with a little bit of light to suggest that you can go inside. And you see some elements to create this, there is something inside, there's an element. And this plaza is, is used in many ways. So, uh, the, and, and the scale, as I was mentioning, that should not be very high so that you can still see the surroundings and, and uh, just becomes a part of it. And they use uh, for outdoor classrooms, this plaza. And then this is, this is the ramp which leads you to, to the main space. Um, and this is how it is uh, used during the performances that there are people standing and watching who doesn't want to sh see the entire show, they just stand here and see. Uh, people who are serious, they want to come inside. Some children like to see from the balcony, they see. And then there's one more balcony and you can see from here. So this is the kind of environment. Uh, And also, like, I wanted to make connection with this water tank because when I went to the site for the first time, this was a very strong feature, and I felt that I, I, I want to see from also inside that. So I, I thought that I should create an opening to remember this. Uh, and a lot of trees that we planted here. And also, like, these elements, you when you travel, you also get inspired with many things. And you try to probably unconsciously it comes when you are working. So this was very strong, strong representation of uh, what I tried to do in Jayjagat Theatre. In Fatehpur I went and I always got fascinated with the staircase. And more important, this crown that it gave, like a, gave like an importance to the entrance. And I felt that I, sh I was trying to mimic it, but not like exactly copying to to that, but also. Uh, in a way that I want to commemorate that in some way. Uh, and I try to do it in, in, in my own way, uh, like this. Uh, there the material was stone, uh, so it used a different uh, construct. Here I was using uh, concrete and brick, so I, I had different flexibility. So, for example, uh, here 
the stone uh, riser and red, both are stone. Here I, I, I could remove the, the member and then there's a different play uh, because of that, of light. So because I was using concrete, I had different flexibility. And then these elements also are like, children like to uh, be in the balcony and this. And I was always remembering uh, Theatre Olympico in which all these small elements made a big difference in, in the entire uh, theatre. And the scale of openings also, I was always thinking about children. So uh, all the measures are, are uh, so that children can feel that it is their own space. So it was, this was the day of the inauguration. Uh, Ila Bhat from Seva, she inaugurated this project. And this was the uh, uh, final model. And if you are interested, you can read uh, what Professor, uh, Mr. Caesar has written about this project. Uh, it is there. Uh, I'm going to talk about another project, uh, which is uh, housing uh, for the loving community. Uh, so in 1968, uh, government of Gujarat provided a piece of land uh, in Vastral to the people who are affected with leprosy. Uh, and uh, there were 125 homes uh, and more than 500 people living in the community. Uh, out of at least 40 still have remnants of leprosy, uh, but they are cured. But still they are handicapped because of the disease. And, and you know that there is a social stigma that people don't want to uh, get into the residences where people affected with leprosy. They are always out in the outskirts and there is always a barrier that uh, people have created so because of the stigma of the disease. Uh, nowadays it has improved but still there is a divide between uh, and there is a discrimination for, for them. Uh, and uh, part of which is quite evident because this piece of land was the most useless piece of land that government could give because it is the lowest point of one site and it floods every monsoon since they, they, they came. So, uh, so if this is the road level, the entire community uh, is here. It's like two meters of uh, difference. And there's like a huge canal, which is now converted into sewage, where all the industrial waste and um, things happen. And then it's not a very good condition to live. So there had, there had been a big struggle uh, since 1968. And then uh, this project started because of Mano Sadhana. Uh, it's an NGO in Ahmedabad. Uh, if you guys go to Ahmedabad, you should definitely visit the place. Uh, uh, and uh, it is the vision of uh, Virin Joshi. Uh, he is the founder that uh, since 2005, he's trying to uh, convince people that we should do something about the housing project. And uh, then th the university, DMU, uh, came uh, to India and then they sponsored prototype houses and then uh, slowly this project got moved forward. Um, so this is the community. So you enter from here. The main road is here. So the slope, the entire slope is towards this direction and this is the canal. Uh, these are the houses. There's a big community hall built by Mano Sadhana because these houses get flooded every monsoon. People with their belongings come to this hall so that uh, they can stay. And and I have seen photographs uh, that it's it's a very unhygienic place to live during the monsoon because the toilets also get flood, flooded and people have no way they could live inside of their homes. So for, what we did was we identified 50 houses, 55 houses first that has no plinth because some of the houses, when people got money, they could they raise the plinth, but still there are like 55 families that they are like below street level. So this is the road level. Then this street level over the period of time, they have kept putting earth and the houses are below the street level, even like 30 centimeters. So we identified 55 houses with the community. And the community is very strong, actually. They really support each other. And these are all people migrated from different states of India. And what has united them is the disease. It's a very strange thing that no religion or no occupation has united, but a disease has united people together. 
so it is very strange in that way but very inspiring to see the unity inside of the community uh, i'm going to show uh, two houses today uh, we have uh, six houses we have built four are under construction so in total by end of uh, january i we we are hoping to finish 10 houses and uh, subsequently with more fundraising we are going to build uh, as per our master plan 50 houses so we are building slowly, step by step. And I think it works greatly in our advantage. So uh, the first house is, uh, is for Narsama uh, uh, and her daughter, uh, Akshara. Uh, they are, uh, she is widow. Uh, her husband had leprosy and she also had leprosy. Uh, and this was the condition of her house without any light and ventilation. There was no window. Uh, and you can see that she has raised this platform like with 30 centimeters almost. And because water used to come inside of her house. So first we identified what to do inside of the community because it, it is a huge project and uh, there are not many uh, uh, funding possibilities. So the university said that we should just do two prototype houses and uh, we'll see how it goes forward. So it started with that. So. Uh, we uh, identified few issues that we really want to focus uh, and Viren Bhai really uh, helped uh, focusing us in the project. So our first concern was that it has to be flood resilient. Uh, it has to improve natural light and ventilation. Uh, of course, it has to be incremental, uh, engage community into the design and building process. It's not something that as an architect, I just go with the plans and we build houses for them. Uh, we wanted uh, to have like a dialogue. So and that was very important. Uh, and engage contractors, fabricators from the community itself. Because I didn't mention that before because many, many people in the community make their living out of asking money from street. And uh, they don't have enough resource uh, to, to, to build their own house. So uh, we we really wanted somehow to uh, engage community in which whatever money we invest goes back to the community itself. That was our, our plan. I didn't know how successful we were, but we, we had this idea uh, since beginning, which I'm going to share. And most important part is that you have to build a house in 4 lakh rupees. So that was a constraint that I was given by the NGO and if the budget goes beyond 4 lakh rupees, the community has to pay, like the owner has to pay. So it was like a double-edged sword for us. If we don't, if we are not very careful about what we are doing, if even if it is like 15, 20,000 rupees above, I don't think that they can afford uh, with the kind of earning because most of the people in the community make 150 to 200 rupees a day. So there's no question that they could spend more than... Um, uh, invest in their houses. So this was the road and this is the house of Narsama Ben. And as you can see that it, it is two meters. So all the water goes to our house in the main, main street. Uh, this was 13 meters long. So it is an unusual uh, plot uh, inside of the community. Rest of the other houses that we are making is very small compared to this, but this one is quite unique. So this was the condition during the monsoons. So what we did was first we demolished the house and made the plinth out of all the waste we got from the house. So uh, all the bricks and so there are like four inches brick thick wall. So we just demolished the house and we made the plinth out of, out of that waste. So we raised the house 90 centimeters. Um, and then we created um, a room here with, with a slab so that future if they want to expand and created an open courtyard and a very small kitchen this was not part of of my of the design brief that that i was given i was told that i should just build a plinth and a room for them uh, and with the discussion with the community they were like oh we should have a kitchen and i felt and then i somehow managed to convince uh, that we should build a kitchen so it, it is like 1.4 meters uh, and created this door such a way that it opens up with the courtyard so it, it feels bigger 
and then in future if they want to expand they can uh, make a rules uh, and i and i didn't have to look for other things because this was the old house it is a front court and a back court so i i thought it was a wonderful uh, organization i i feel that i should carry forward some of the good things so i created this courtyard which was there and then i i just added a small kitchen and a store and this big opening just spills over so this becomes more of a private space uh, and then this is the front part and and the new toilets of course so this is the old and the new uh, section and we used uh, some of the doors like old house has this door and it has this colors blue and uh, uh, yellow so we just uh, refurbished it and we painted it new and this becomes the part of the new construction so this is like from inside now uh, this is the courtyard and the kitchen and this was the door uh, i was talking about you you should remember this slide because i'm going to tell you a story uh, after this and then uh, this was the day of the inauguration and people really uh, uh, they were very happy and when the, the lady the owner she said that never in her dream she thought that she would live in a house like that and she told me thank you and and i was like no we should thank you because as a society we have we have so much discrimination we have somehow failed to somehow look into the situation and i think that it also made me question uh, many things as as an as an architect we should also focus on many other areas not for only percentage of people who can afford to build so i think that it was very important lesson for us also that we have to change our way of looking at architecture uh, and and this was the o condition before and now the house is like this and of course like i i took up some of the elements from the neighbors so that they look cousins but but i i feel that uh, there's so much uh, we can contribute uh, by our expertise i think that uh, we can work and uh, make a better living, living condition and we also had this skill development workshops at the community so one of my professor uh, professor jay shukla uh, he came uh, to the community to teach us how to make uh, floor tiles out of waste marble dust because at the school he was experimenting and and i saw uh, the wonderful uh, work that they were doing and i asked if 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 he can teach us and then he came to the community and not not, not only taught us but also like people to the of the community and now people are making tiles for us so i'm going to show you more details about that and then we had this uh, ferro cement workshop by arjun doshi and and uh, his team uh, he he was he was very kind enough to come to amdavad and and teach us uh, ferro cement and we did a paper mash workshop from school so students also came uh, my students came and then students from dmu came so we did this workshop and and Prof. jay shukla was there and he was teaching and and she is nasama so she is make she is responsible to make the tiles of her own house and anyways we are going to procure material from outside so we thought that we will pay her uh, if she makes the tiles for us and she didn't she was making 150 rupees working in a metal industry and here she would make almost twice uh, we have the calculation i can show uh, by doing just making tiles uh, uh, she uh, uh, two person when work together make 100 tiles a day and per tile we were paying 8 uh, rupees so very uh, simple way these frames they were given by by our professor and uh, ravi umbrana uh, one of the student and then we did, we managed to make different kinds of tiles and in this first prototype house we 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 installed the tiles and it was done by nasama and, uh, and this was the team and also i learned many other things uh, as a professional that we have to change our working methods was uh, as in schools we are trained to uh, do working drawings in a specific way or ask uh, uh, estimates in a specific way but in practice there are so many 
place is that people don't understand uh, the way we are professionally uh, taught or learned in offices. So when I ask uh, the estimate, like because I wanted to work with a contractor from the community itself, so I asked, so I want to build a house, so and I gave them the set of drawings to get an estimate, and he just gave me this, uh, and and I was like. I have to also uh, discuss this with many other stakeholders that I need to have a detailed estimate. And I was like, no, I need to have. And he was like, no, I, I don't know how to do it. And then I was like, how, how do we find the middle ground? And, uh, and then he also gave me the set of drawings back. And he said, no, I don't need this. I, I don't know how to read the drawings. So I said, how, how are we going to build this house? So... He said that, why don't you come to the site and tell me that build a room here, I'll build for you and build a toilet. And I said, I can't be, I can't be on the site uh, all, all the months that you're building. So what we did was uh, we made a model and we wrote all the dimension on the model itself. So then it was much easier for him to, to construct because it was three-dimensional and drawings probably sometimes doesn't... Uh, help communicating easily. Uh, and the same story goes with this door. Uh, so I was working with a fabricator from the community and uh, on the first day he said that he knows how to read drawings and I was like, great. So I gave him the drawings uh, and you know, in in profession, we we uh, are told, uh, we, we, we draw that, where is the swing line, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> so so I don't know like I used to go to the site and used to keep seeing it and I was like on the last day I don't know why he decided to put this because he didn't put till the last day and he, he again tried to read the drawing and he thought that he missed a member so he put these members like this and I was so upset I was like no you spoiled the entire door and everything and this guy was super sad that uh, he said, oh, I made a mistake and I'll give you your money back. And I was like, no, I mean, I think there's a problem from my, from our side. So what we did was we mirrored the door, like we shifted the door and then we made this pattern. So it looked like a design, you know, so. <laughs> so, so, it, it was, so it taught me that, no, we have to change our ways to, to, to communicate architecture. And uh, we have changed our ways uh, since then, uh, working in many places actually. And this was always in consent with the community. So we also changed the way we, we used to make models. So now we started to make models with very much detail because for the first two houses, I used to make like very simple models like uh, uh, white models without details, just with, with a human. And they used to not discuss much, they used to say, fine, this is okay. And then only after building two houses, I I started to realize there are so many problems in the in the houses in terms of storage, in terms of many other things that they were very modest that they didn't tell uh, me because they were so they felt that they were so great, grateful that the house getting built. And and I was like, no, it has to be a dialogue. So we what we started to do is we started photographing uh, uh, each uh, belonging of them and we used to put it in scale. So these are all models that are prepared in our office. Uh, Akash and Anish, uh, they both made fantastic models. Um, and, and this is how we start to make models with all the colors and everything, like fans and how, where all the belongings. So they understand how exactly or possibly their belongings is going to fit. So so this is uh, another house that I'm going to show which is quite different from, from the house here. So this is very small house, like this is four and a half meters by six meters uh, and six people live in the house and she she's a woman and uh, her job is to keep tying uh, belt holders in a bunch. So she, uh, from the factories, people come and then they give work. So most of her day, she works like this outside on the street. And this is a photograph from inside of her house. And she's sitting on the street right now. So imagine the level difference in the house. And this was not a very good 
living condition. It was very damp and there was no ventilation. Like there was this only this opening. There was no other opening uh, inside of the house. So it was not a very good condition. So six people living in the house and there was no toilet in the house also. So they used to use public toilets, uh, which is in the community. So generally what people do is like, if this is the condition, they will build two floors in order to accommodate. The resultant is like they have this very uh, narrow uh, condition and then there is no light here. So our strategy was that we we always want, if you're going two floors, because the plot is too small, we want to create a setback and then build another uh, room here. So there are two rooms and then there's a courtyard. So there's always a transition from from this mass. So uh, because there are six people in the family, uh, the ground floor, uh, what we thought is as, as a kitchen, like a small multi-purpose room come kitchen. So there's a platform, but it can be used as a sleeping space in the night. And then uh, few people can, uh, two people can sleep here. And then they have children. So what we created was this small loft uh, with the ferro cement roof that Arjun helped us to, to make. Uh, and then the ferro cement staircase also he helped us to make. So this was the... The loft. Um, so, if someone else also wants to make, they can also uh, propose a house like this. But then the street is doesn't feel too constrained, and they can make different roofs. Make they can use metal, they can use ferro cement, they can use RCC slab. But at least the street is always uh, uh, it doesn't feel that it is too small. So, this was the existing house and this is what we have proposed and it is built now so the, there's a small bathroom toilet here uh, kitchen space and then uh, uh, so this is the house and now she has this one her own courtyard to to work this is from inside just to put this keep the scale uh, you understand how is the volume uh, these are also the tiles made by the people from the community. So now there are like five women in the community who have taken the lead to make tiles. So uh, earlier what I used to do, I used to buy material from them, uh, for them, and they used to uh, make tiles and we used to pay the labor charge. But now what is good is that now we have given the responsibility to them directly to buy material and uh, do the labor board. So uh, they are like getting self uh, sustained that way and also now I just help them to check the mixes and stuff so uh, that's the only thing that um, my role has reduced to which I'm very happy and this is the uh, first in staircase uh, which I was talking about and then this when when this door opens up it spills to the to the courtyard but I want to confess that she is not very happy with this door. Uh, she thinks that it is too big the door for a house because the doors are quite quite nice there, and she feels that. But I was I keep trying to explain her that the reason is that it it opens up and you it doesn't feel so small. But uh, there's always a dislike. Uh, another house. Uh, I'm not going to show in detail, but this is we recently built. Uh, this is for a grandmother. We, we, she's old and she she goes to the street to ask money. She makes her living like that. She she doesn't have anyone in the family and she has severe leprosy. So she lives alone. So we did what we did was we kept uh, a kitchen on the outside uh, and a room here so that always a connection with the street when she is alone. Uh, and there was a nice tree. So. It becomes a nice coat. This is another house that we recently completed uh, for family, and now we also created this staircase to go up. Um, recently inaugurated. Um, the last project I'm going to talk is School for the Visually Impaired Students. I don't know, I, am I running out of time or I'm okay? I'm fine, okay. So, this is a very uh, important project and very close to my heart because um, I've been working on this project since 2000, 
14 when I got this project. And only now it has started to, to realize. Uh, and also I'm happy that I got so much time to do so many iterations. Uh, I'm going to show a bit in detail how the design process happened. So to give a bit brief background about the school, so this school was started by two friends, uh, Rehman Bhai and Hargu Govind Bhai, and they were both blind. And they started the school with four, four children in a village called Kolwa in, in Gandhinagar. It's nearby Gandhinagar. And in, small, in villages and small towns, uh, there is no formal education fa facilities for blind children. And there are superstition in certain villages like theirs. It was regarded as curse. So there were students who were, I don't know if it is true, but I heard the story that they were living in stables uh, with animals. So it was quite shocking that this happens uh, also. I, I, I don't know. I've heard all these stories from them. So, so the school was uh, dedicated for the education uh, and well-being for the children from the remote villages and uh, around Gujarat and other states of India. This is how the school started, actually. And eventually government, because of this intention, government gave them this piece of land in Gandhinagar sector 16, where th there was this uh, school, primary school, now defunct. They gave them, them this building to use. Uh, so it is a two-story building. Um, so on the ground floor, uh, students live and on the first floor, they use as a school. Uh, but over the time, the number of students have grown. So now there are like 60 students in the school. So what, what has started to happen is that they have this um, not a very good condition because in each room, there are like eight, 10 students living in bunk beds. It's a very uh, complicated situation. So what... Uh, what we have decided was that this existing block, we will convert entire building into a hostel in which, so that each room has their own toilets. Uh, there are only three or four students living in a room. And we build a new academic building so that uh, it is specific for them. It, it is not just adaptive reuse building. And I tried to see many examples in India. Very less example I came across uh, that uh, school designed specifically for blind students. Professor Doshi has designed one school, eventually told once, but I couldn't, I never saw it anywhere. So, so this is the existing building, uh, the dining here is here, uh, and there are a lot of trees, and there is a garden here. Um, so, first idea was was that I should build something opposite to the existing building and I created this create this open space between this building so that they could easily commute. Uh, and also over time, the dining also becomes a part of this entire loop. And this can be just free ground. Uh, but you know that this, uh, this has gone through so many years and then program has evolved and uh, their expectations were changed and uh, they, they proposed that we should have 12 classrooms and then uh, we want to add a hall in which they can gather 100 students for the annual function. So the requirements are changed. So here, I don't know, I could not build, but I, I'll show you. So what, what I did was first thing is that uh, a very clear circulation like linear corridor and then circular classroom the reason is that I I had an impression that we should not have any edges uh, in blind school. Uh, that was my first instinctive reaction, and it changed over time. That I'm also going to discuss further. But this was this I was, I started, and the reason is that also like keeping all the classroom separate is because initially we didn't have funding, so we made this corridor and like two classrooms, and then they can keep adding these units over the period of time without disturbing the building. So that was our basic idea. Uh, and then what I was thinking that, okay, if they're going to move through the corridor, uh, 
so how do we know which direction they are moving? So one wall was I made like a bit different, like uh, this curvy linear, and then another wall is smooth, which is here. So I was starting to think how they navigate. Even if I was very trying uh, very conceptual, I was thinking about that. But uh, as I said earlier, that requirements change and. I, I, I don't think that uh, considering the present requirement, I could build anything here because for the future expansion also, it's a problem. Uh, so then I started looking at this area of the site, uh, which is 81 meters by 57 meters. It's a big piece of land. So I was initially skeptical to build here because it's such a big space that I don't know how do you make a building in, in uh, have a contained space so that they don't get like lost in this big piece of land. So that's why I was proposing here so that it becomes more cozy. But eventually we, we made a proposal here. So this was another sketch in which I instinctively drew a very uh, uh, closed kind of a school that like have a garden in the center uh, that becomes like a container uh, in the space and then you, you, you can keep adding uh, to that loop. So it was a very primitive idea. Uh, so I was, I was saying that to create a container, but keeping the same idea that this corridor, uh, the classroom has units so that they could uh, uh, evolve over time, they could add. Um, then I was also thinking, why not to create variations in volumes uh, so that some classrooms are special, some classrooms are, are normal. Um, and then this becomes like a, a school with, with a center uh, where everything opens up. Uh, but then in a circle, uh, I realized that they will not get any reference. I mean, this is like a continuous loop. They will not be able to figure out where they are. So I started shifting it and create a ramp uh, so that you have a narrower space here, bigger space here, and a ramp which always orient you. And luckily, I later for the, for the next five months, I was working in, uh, in, in Perkins School for, for, for the Blind in the United States. It is the first blind school in America. And uh, people like... Helen Keller and Laura Bridgman and everyone uh, stu studied there, and Sullivan. They were very important figures. And there I was able to discuss this proposal with professors. They were great. And, and, it, I, and it, it, is, it was one of the best campuses I've seen, like uh, in, uh, I've seen. So it, it, it was a very important place. And I was learning a lot. And they also recommended that this is not a good geometry for the blind school. So, this was uh, my earlier proposal. Uh, we, we also made models and, you know, uh, detailed models with all uh, furniture. And uh, I, I'm going to show you how we use this to communicate our project. So, this was the in-between space. And I was almost ready with the design thinking that we are going to start building. And now I understood that this is not a good proposal. Um, so, they said that I should not use circle is a geometry or square because in square also all four sides are equal so they will not be able to orient themselves so I should work with rectilinear geometry in which two sides are small and two sides are long so I restarted working on my proposal but keeping the same logic uh, to keep a central space uh, and, and the circulation space but also refining that that I have like a bigger space on one side, a very small space on the other side, but also changing in volume that from here, you have a very long volume, high volume, but in here it's very low volume. So when, when they speak also, they, they, they could gauge the space. Because in Perkins, I saw that wherever they had the cross junctions, they used to change the volume drastically. So with the eco also, they were identifying places. So it was very consciously designed there. And then same logic of uh, classrooms uh, as unit, uh, but I made sure that I have like four special classrooms because in Perkins I saw uh, that they have specific classrooms just to see movies. Uh, and I was really surprised and very happy to see that 
they have uh, specific movies for, for blind students. So they are like this descriptive movies. So it is like any uh, theater uh, that you see that students are sitting in, in a row, but uh, there's a projector and there's a speaker. But then, uh, then but the, the thing is that the movie was descriptive, meaning that if, if a person is going, if there is a scene in which a person is going to pick up a telephone, we can see, so we can relate uh, the movie, but if the person is not able to see and if there is no dialogue, so what they do is they pause the movie and then there is a description that a person uh, wearing a red, sh red shirt is moving towards a telephone which is yellow and there is a window on the top, the light is coming and then after that description, the movie starts again. So I was like really, really surprised with this and they were enjoying movie like anything. So. My first thing was in, in our school we should have that facility. So we made a spe specific classroom for that. So that uh, of course it is multifunctional room, but students should be able to see uh, movies and experience uh, and enjoy that. Um, and then uh, we have this big hall in which they can have uh, various performances. And also it can be built on phases, like first four special classroom and hall, and then these units, which are normal classrooms, can be built over time. Um, and how do you, uh, I don't know, there's, there's a problem with the hatch here, but how do you know which is outside and inside? So the place where, where we have outside exterior space, like courtyards, we always make sure that the floor is brick, and wherever we are, in interior space, we use stone. So one very clear this, uh, decision we made was like, how do you separate out two spaces with materials? And we wanted to make it very simply, not want to use a lot of material, but at the same time, uh, have this definition. And also the courtyard was uh, important because I did not create any openings on the exterior, but I always brought light from the courtyard. The reason is, Partially blind students are very sensitive with direct light. So uh, at Perkins also I learned that the light is very important. Natural light is important as well as artificial light in the school, in the blind school is important. So uh, courtyard is very important in a way that uh, it brings in diffuse light to the classroom and also it becomes like an extension to the classroom. So each cl classroom has an opening to the courtyard. So uh, we were opening uh, and then uh, we also were planting specific kind of landscape uh, trees uh, and plants so that uh, each quota is special and also they'll be able to uh, navigate through fragrances. I don't know how successful it, it can be, but we, we have uh, incorporated in our design decision. So this is the sketch. This is drawn by Akash. Uh, very, he draws very well. Uh, and uh, he, this is the kind of light uh, um, uh, we, we, we are going to have in the classroom. This is the corridor. Uh, and also like whenever there is an entrance to the class, we created like this huge openings with light so that it creates a contrast from dark and light. So they also know the accesses to the class. This is one way of figuring out. Another way of figuring out is, I, I don't know, the, the hatches are not coming well in this uh, slides. But anyways. So uh, the stone uh, here, here um, how do you identify which classroom you're going? So we also created textures in stone. So we've used quota stone. Uh, so here there will be like smooth quota stone, but during the entrance, it becomes rough. So they all also identify uh, how uh, are the classroom entrances. And we also worked with different textures. Uh, so the exterior has one texture, uh, then there are two textures in, in the interior. So one is a smooth finish plaster, which always runs on the periphery of the classroom. And then the rough finish always goes on, on the interior part of the corridor 
uh, marking that this is the corridor, this is the wall of the courtyard. So they will be able to orient themselves as well. Uh, so as I was saying that uh, the exterior has similar kind of plaster which we use in Jai Jagat theater also. Uh, the, this is smooth and this is rough. And also in rough, we have two uh, patterns. Is uh, on the longer side, we have horizontal patterns, so they can understand which side are they in, either short side or long side, so it's horizontal pattern. And then on the shorter side, we have vertical patterns. And as I was saying that the courtyards have uh, different kind of plants and trees, uh, which will also help possibly in navigating the classrooms. And this is how uh, it sits with the existing building. It is now under construction. So I have some photographs of construction. These are the classrooms. And these are some of the drawings uh, on, uh, of, the, of the building. But here I wanted to discuss this more importantly because uh, method of communication was extremely difficult in this project and I didn't know how to do it because we can read drawings so uh, we can communicate with our our clients with drawings or models but how do you com communicate with people who cannot see or part they can see partially so that was a big challenge and and uh, initially this uh, I used to show them the models but the problem here was that they can't figure out interior spaces. So they could understand the overall form, but interior spaces were very difficult. So what, what we started to do is that we started to create different textures. So different. And I saw this 3D printer uh, for the first time uh, personally in, in GSD. And I was like very impressed by the machine. And I thought that this could be a wonderful tool for us. To, to make drawings actually. So we started making sample drawings through 3D printer. So for example, this is the corridor, uh, which has th this kind of pattern. These are the symbols which shows that the entry of the classroom is here. This is the exterior texture. Uh, this is a texture of the courtyard. And uh, this also shows that you have to move to the balcony. So there's a triangle, so it shows like that. So we, experimented all these drawings with students and this is one of the drawing and to my surprise it worked very well uh, with the students and they really enjoyed actually the entire process and we used to make all these models with uh, with um, furniture and they can touch and feel how it, it might be and also it is very sturdy so it don't break so uh, I think this was quite a useful tool and uh, we really enjoyed and for the partially blind students we also made contrasting drawings so with white blue goes very well red and these are all scientific studies that you can see we just try to implement through our drawings uh, and with white black is of course quite contrasting and yellow and red can work and we also made this drawing so this is the part plan and also we made one is to one drawing on the site before constructing we also worked with students and all the trustees to make them imagine how big the school is and surprisingly that once we showed uh, the entire school walking hand by hand they created a mind map and they understood it quite well and they counted the number of steps from one end of the corridor to the another end of the corridor and it was quite remarkable to see how they gauge spaces and how they visualize spaces and uh, this is now under construction and I don't think that whatever we have done is possible without all the people who have worked on this uh, project. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anand. Uh, 
sorry for the technical glitches. We'll, we'll have to figure out what went wrong with the slides. But what we'll do is we'll patch up your PDF with our uh, archives so people can see the drawings more uh, intimately and properly. So, yeah, I mean, I would like to open it to the audience. Are there any comments? It's very really rare that we have an architect who shows three projects, but they are so engrossing that you feel that you've gained so much. Uh, and it was really, uh, uh, really nice to go through with you slowly through the projects. Thank you. So that, that embedded slowness in your project is very, very interesting. So my question isn't directly related to your project, uh, but uh, I want to ask you about the second project. Uh, did you uh, encounter any strategies that the community adopted against the flood on an open level? There was no strategy. I mean, the houses were getting flooded every monsoon, and they were going to this big community hall uh, and living in, in in that since the last two or three years, government has because now it, this issue has been there so since the last 25, 30 years. Now they have started to feel that we should do something about it. The government, so they have started to uh, put the pumping stations nearby. So they made one pumping station, but of course it is not very uh, effective. Uh, houses still get flooded, but some. It is not as bad as before, but still houses get flooded. So there is one pumping station which pumps uh, the water uh, from the community and it goes to, to the canal. And then there is a big well there, so it goes goes to that. But there is no formal strategy as such to, to reduce flooding at the moment. And I hope that uh, it has to be thought, thought about. It's a very important thing because we just keep building houses, but if it doesn't work, and it, and also the part of the problem is that earlier the entire settlement meant was in isolation because it was in outskirts of Ahmedabad. There were there were no buildings around. So over the period of time, what started happen is that buildings came around, and also people have started building compound walls. So the natural flow of water has stopped because of all the buildings and the new compound walls. So it is like a saucer now the community. So that's why it floods uh, every monsoon. Thanks. So my question would be for the first project that you showed, the Jai Jagat Theatre. So basically you explained everything about the site and the setting and the brief that was given to you. But uh, my question would be that when you were designing for such for such a site which had such a rich history, did you have anything that you took back from that or some technique which they have used or something which had a very strong historic uh, context to it. Very important question. I was very scared to do that project because this project we just got by chance and uh, and of course it is as you said that it was uh, uh, in a very important place and also Ahmedabad also is very uh, but uh, what what I I try to do is I for, for a few months I was just going in and around Ashram looking at how uh, they have built. So, not to mimic, uh, not to use the same element or same materials, but understand the spirit. Uh, I mean, how they have thought in their own time. Uh, Nehru Museum is one of the great examples, uh, very inspiring. So, whenever I used to go there, I used to get boosted up that okay, we should do something uh, that relates to the space. So, we were going around uh, for for a so, so long time to uh, see, see buildings. But I was not only looking at ashram as a, as a reference, but I was also looking how people have thought theaters, um, more of, uh, I don't know, looking at universal examples. But of course, uh, it has to relate to the place. If it doesn't, then it doesn't make sense. So I feel that what we have done is an independent construct in that way, but uh, we have thought about the levels, the water, 
the land, the trees, how you move around. Uh, so the materials we have used, uh, brick and concrete. Uh, part of the reason I have used concrete, I was not very keen in using concrete in Ashram. Uh, I was uh, thinking of creating a retaining wall uh, out of stone, uh, but con concrete was best possible material. Also, we had a lot of constraint in, in the budget. Uh, and there are many stakeholders that you are dealing with. So uh, concrete was the material which retains and also uh, uh, retains with the water, water part also. It, it contains properly. So only the part of the uh, place where I needed to retain, I used concrete. But rest, everywhere I used bricks, which is locally available. Um, and all these elements, like small elements like balcony and the stairs, I think that those are the elements that came through my experiences of travel and my fascinations. And, and also I was thinking about children, that how it can become the part of... So I think I, whenever, as an architect, I think when you design, design you are talking about only uh, a specific place, but you, are, you have so many references in your mind uh, that when you are drawing it, it comes. And probably when you are doing a rigorous process, then it becomes a part of this, although it is from probably Fatehpur uh, Sikri. So, so this was uh, the process. And, and I didn't show the iterations. Uh, so we had three iterations before we came to this final option. Uh, probably next time I can show you in detail. Uh, but we had done a lot of process with Dino because he was not a client, kind of a client who will compromise on anything. And I was very lucky to have, have him on board because he used to constantly challenge us. Uh, the second option of, of our design was we made the working drawings uh, and we were ready to construct. And in the last moment, we felt it was not going along with the idea. I mean, then we, we changed it and we did what whatever was in our power to, or our understanding to work on that place. And I was very scared uh, to work there. But thankfully, uh, it went fine so far. Hello. So what were your strategies to overcome sanitation problem? Like how did you manage it? Like you can't just send it in the canal because it will obviously backflow to the houses. So how, what were the existing conditions? So, the, there are drainage lines uh, in, in the community and uh, my only strategy was to raise the plinth. Uh, I could not, like, I was given like 8 lakh rupees to build two houses. Uh, so, I, the best possible I could do is that I, I raise the plinth so that uh, toilet didn't get clogged in monsoon. And then I, of course, made sure that it has proper pipes and it goes to the drainage which was there in the existing. But it has to be thought on a larger picture, uh, not on just an architectural intervention that we are doing. So right now, we are just focusing on raising the houses. That's what we are doing honestly. Yeah, so the question I had was about uh, your last project, which is the School for Blind. So um, you have played a lot with multi-sensory experiences and all, right? So um, I didn't understand how you utilize sense of smell uh, in terms of navigation uh, and uh, experience as well. Yeah, I can give you an example. Like this court chairs that we, we made. So each classroom opens to one court chair. And the court chairs are connected to the circulation spaces. So. I'll give you an example that one coach we thought of uh, having with Champa and one coach we are thinking of having with Saptapurni tree. They are very strong fragrances. Then we have these creepers we call Juhi that. So I have tried to talk to people who has knowledge about local landscape, like what we can plant and how we can uh, use this. Uh, and I, as I said in my slide, that I don't know how successful it might be, but uh, when I was talking to the professor at Perkins and also like few people in 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 Ahmedabad, they say that you can have probably uh, uh, sense of smell as a possible navigation, but not primarily relying on on that. So that's why we have 
floor as uh, we use as different textures and floors to identify space or walls we have used. We also use colors that so once it is built, you will be able to see that we also use contrasting colors inside of, of the building. So our entire building, I'm imagining is terracotta and that interior are like white uh, with very uh, stark furniture, like so that they, they could gauge things, uh, uh, objects and, and, and spaces very differently. So colors is one method, textures from the floor is another method, third is uh, the word textures and fourth one that I also thought was smell, but I am not sure that uh, how successful it might because yeah. I, I never seen it anywhere. So we are trying, trying to see how it goes. Was sense of uh, sound also used in certain way? Yeah, the volumes that I was uh, in the corridor that I was uh, I was talking about that there are two volumes. One is three point six meters high, which is on one side of a corridor, and then there's the other side, which is like two point one meters. So it entirely slopes in one direction. So when you are in one side of the corridor, you you can orient yourself while you're talking because they have a different echo uh, compared to the other side. And also the classrooms have different volumes. Special classrooms has very low heights. Uh, the normal classrooms have 3.6 meters height and the special classroom is 2.7 meters. So four classrooms has, uh, special classroom has particular height and the rest of the other classrooms are higher. So they also understand uh, through that volume. Thank you, Anand, for this really delightful presentation. Um, I, I think it's also what is really wonderful is the way you constantly change your methods of making drawings, right? Like you say, the drawing becomes suddenly a three-dimensional, um, the metal becomes a three-dimensional drawing, the communication tools that you build for the blind. Um, I mean, I'm just sort of thinking also a lot of the references uh, that you've been seeing showing us haven't come from any form of drawing, right? Like they might come from the orthographic drawing, which is also a colonial tool. It started with Swinton Jacobs first time making the Jaipur portfolio. And then we all started drawing like that. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm just thinking, you know, when I'm just seeing it, it's, it's wonderful the journey that you've taken in your design process. I'm always wondering whether this form of experimenting with drawing would also go back and affect the design process. You know, rather than only being a communicating tool. Mm -hmm. So I'm mean, just sort of thinking through this. Oh. But yeah. That's a wonderful observation. I never thought like that actually. So I was just because this situation had come to me and I had to solve it, so I tried to change the method. And on the way I was also questioning what how we have been working. Like I worked for five years in in Thrombus Deshi's office, a very particular way of communicating architecture working and and here I was also uh, having uh, different challenges because uh, the users were completely different in the office I was working for very different users so I think that because of that also it uh, made a big difference because I got this uh, challenge and we had to work this out so but I, I never thought like that I, I would definitely give, give a thought um, no, I don't have a question. I just have a, a reaction or something. Um, I think what was very nice throughout the presentation was the kind of the entire gentle nature of the presentation, like and the slowness with which you kind of address everything, like like how you look at the building, how you what you do with the materials, uh, how do you talk about that to someone else. This kind of like very really beautiful sense of gentleness. And kind of meditating, uh, meditation on everything what you do as a practitioner, and I think that's I think I think it's a great learning for us as teachers and students that how do you meditate on things when you design and everything whether it's the catching the water tank or is you know just uh, making that balcony or just uh, catching the small windows in the house or, and it's very kind of I think the the slowness of the presentation and the slowness of the. Um, the design and you know the method of designing, I think that's really something which I think we can learn from. Thank you. Thank you so much. In just carrying forward from this, does this know is this slowness borrowed from your engagement with the two masters? I I think that 
I can tell you two instances that when I was a student at, at Rajkot and um, I, I joined uh, Sangat and uh, um, when I was working, I I remember that once Prof. Goshi really scolded me. Uh, even during my thesis that whenever I was to, because I was doing my thesis with him and whenever I was to show him the option, he would say, Oh, perhaps you know a lot actually. When uh, and I, I was not able to understand why he was saying. And then he 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 said that you come to conclusions very fast. So he said that that you should not come to conclusions very fast. It, it can be a trap. And he used to criticize me all the time because I was I was getting into my design and uh, I used to show him. And this is all. This is also like we are trained, right? That uh, at at school. We have very constrained limitations of, of semester, right? That we have three months or three and a half months and we, we solve many things. So sometimes our nature as, as a student, it becomes quite obvious that we have to work fast because uh, you have to reach to a particular point, right? Uh, after uh, uh, doing, and you are also colleagues that also working. There's always a pressure that okay, you need to cope up. Uh, and I think that that is a part of an issue also that uh, the education. And I I think that I was uh, learning uh, to work slowly at Professor Dushi and also I think that there's a very nice article Caesar has also written that. Yeah, in that he, he said a good architect always works slowly. So I, I don't know, I mean, not in every situation this this can be possible, but I think that, of course, that uh, with all these three projects, if for JJ the theater, if, if Nimo would have not given enough time to do all the studies, I don't think that we could have, I, I would have built the first option that I made, uh, and which I don't like now. Uh, we would have just built that. If you would have not gone, or for example, luckily this got this project got so much postponed because of funding. Because in 2014, I got this project 14 15, yeah. and then 16, we were going to build it, and uh, they got the money. And in the end, uh, somehow, they they had they, the money they got, they had to invest it somewhere else, so they could not build the school. And I was disappointed because I, I made a proposal in, for the blind school and it's not going to get built. But now they came, uh, sorry, now in 2017 they came back and said, oh, now we have money. So then uh, I got enough time because of this postponement. I think I got lucky on the way for the blind school project that I got enough time. Then I went to Perkins, I talked to people, then I changed my first design. So I think it is important to invest time uh, in the design process. Seeing that instead of you chasing slowness, slowness is chasing you. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. One of the things I was uh, constantly thinking about while uh, observing your projects is the strong uh, rootedness in geometry. There's a very, uh, you work through a very geometrical logic whether asserting it or defying it, but I think there is a very uh, strong geometric base. Where does that come from and how conscious are you about that in your design process? No, you are right, because I think that in Jajagat Theatre is very, uh, since the beginning, like my f both of my previous alternatives are very strong geometry. Uh, it's not that I started because I wanted to have a particular geometry, also this this place demanded because I was saying that it was a very irregular corner and it needed a structure, I felt. And then I felt that this circular geometry without touching all these three irregular corners will really help me to define the space and make like a container so it came. But also like when I, I, I also got very fascinated in, in when I was traveling in Rome with Marwana and I saw that all the structures were very geometrical and of course there are like so many drawings that we make and also you see so many buildings and probably there are so many other influences that come but I never consciously started that I want to start with a geometrical but it somehow 
came because of so many other circumstances. So I think these travels and other things that also influences. And I think also the nature of education uh, makes geometry and architect second nature. <laughs> uh, sure. But but on that note, I was thinking that were were there. Like, would it have been possible to release in the school for the blind uh, uh, from geometry? Like, uh, did it have to uh, kind of be so close? Because I think the notion of boundary for the blind uh, is not the same as for people as for people who can see. So, uh, could it have explored possibilities of challenging the notion in which? Boundaries are articulated in architecture. Otherwise, hmm. there are two two challenges. Uh, one was uh, since I was building on a big piece of land, like eighty meters by sixty five meters, I had to have like a open space, but a space which is like contained, so that they can gauge that space. They don't get lost. Like hundred students doesn't get lost in this huge ground, so that was one very important uh, factor. The reason also, like I had the strict uh, walls, the peripheral without openings and just openings for the courtyard, is two reasons. One is that light was a major concern for for us uh, to get indirect light through the courtyard, and also the sound because. They don't have one sense. The other sense is extremely powerful. So sense of hearing, like. But I also understood that uh, when they are in the classroom and you directly open the classrooms to to the exterior spaces, what happens? They get really distracted very easily. So also it did certain definitions regarding that. Uh, but from the eye level, I think that there are a lot of connections that we have. Uh, try to uh, create, um, uh, and I think that once probably it, it might get built, probably I could discuss more. But you are right in a way that it is very uh, enclosed, uh, and it was a very conscious move that we made. Some of them, but yeah, I, I'm just thinking that was there a possibility to kind of make people who can see think differently, hmm. or people who who can see. See differently, observe differently, and in that in that frame of argument, could uh, could the like did the building need to have the same aesthetic mm. as an architect with an eye can mm. appreciate it? So 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 I'm I'm thinking that if the building could could also engage the people who can see in a very different kind of discourse mm-hmm. about aesthetic beauty building living inhabiting and so on so so yes i mean it's a very successful project certainly uh, but i'm just trying to kind of stretch my imagination with what an architect what kind of discourses of space an architect can push for through through the project okay Okay. If we continue this, I'll keep on talking with you myself, like a movie. Uh, but uh, I think uh, there's a lot we have gained from this uh, so rich much. presentation. Thank you so much thank for you. sharing your thoughts, and thank you all for joining us uh, uh, for this uh, presentation. Our next uh, CCT event uh, will be uh, a fortnight down the line, and we'll post the details very soon. So please stay connected to our portals. You can, if you're not on our mailing list, uh, you can. Uh, then you go to the C website and join our mailing list, and we'll add you in our subsequent uh, postings. So, thank you so much, and uh, please come back. Soon.